All right, we're live. <laughs> good morning, um, good afternoon, good evening, everyone, wherever you are right now. My name is Bokat Becher, and I'm from the University of Zurich. And on behalf of Global Immunotalks, I welcome you uh, again to another rendition of Global Immunotalks here this, uh, today. Um, we are very excited and super happy for our guests today that we could uh, convince Roxanne Tusivant to be our speaker here today. And um, let me say a few words. So hello, Roxanne. <laughs> let me say a few words about Roxanne. Um, Roxanne graduated in 2002 uh, in biology at the University of Milano in Italy. In 2006, she um, um, received her PhD at the um, uh, Institute of, for Research in Biomedicine in Bellinzona, that's in Switzerland, under the supervision of Markus Manz. And there she worked on uh, dendritic cell development. Um, from 2006 to 2010, Roxanne worked with the late, sadly late, Ton Rolling at the University of Basel, again in Switzerland, but there this time on early hematopoietic development. And you see the theme is emerging here. In 2010, Roxanne came to the States uh, to Wash U in St. Louis to work with Ken Murphy, who has been a speaker at Global Immune Talks not uh, long ago, um, to work on DC development. Now, uh, after this rather illustrious uh, uh, training career in 2014, she became an assistant professor at the University of Basel. And in 2019, she has been uh, recruited to the NIH to work at the uh, NIDCR. Now, um, so Roxanne has been doing a lot of work on the transcriptional regulation of hematopoietic, hematopoietic cells and uh, um, cell commitment in, in, in dendritic cell biology. And she won um, numerous awards, has very, very many wonderful publications. She won the Tobik Award from the Society of Leukocyte Biology, et cetera. Just, there's so many awards I can't mention. Well, actually, also the 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 the, the assistant professorship in in Basel was an award from the Swiss National Science Foundation. So she's got quite a bit of awards and recognition for her work. And I think one of the things that I that stands out in in Roxanne's work was the identification of the origin of plasmacyte, uh, plasmacytoid dendritic cells. So she, I think she, she really had a, a rather tremendous impact in understanding that these are not just the normal myeloid cells we've always thought they were. Um, and as you may know, at the, uh, in the beginning of Global Immunotox, uh, what we do is we ask a, a general generic question and um, Roxanne may I ask you, so first of all, welcome here today. And can I ask you, could you share with us one of the most impactful decisions in your scientific career. Yeah, so so thank you. Thank you so much, Burkert, and thank you everyone from the Global Immunotalk. It's really, it's really an honor to be here and it is very special. I thought it was an incredible initiative um, during COVID and I'm very glad that it is continuing and I hope it's gonna keep going for many years to come. And, um, and thank you, Burkhardt, for the invitation and, and for the question. So, which is, um, it's, it's very um, important to me. So like, and, and let me start with saying that what is matters is always to seek for more knowledge and for more challenges. And it is important not to put limits to your path. So in my case, what was the, probably the most impactful decision was uh, um, to continue in research. And, and this um, required a, like a significant move from Switzerland to US, which was not an easy choice for many personal reasons. But there I joined Ken and, and Teresa Murphy's lab and it is without any doubts the most impactful decision in my career. So he believed in me like nobody else had, had done before. He has been an incredible mentor and a friend, and I could not be more grateful for the time I spent in his lab. And so to everyone um, at the beginning of their career, I would say, don't be afraid to dare and believe in yourself. Find a true mentor 
and there are no limits to what you can wish for. So. Wow. Thanks, Roxanne. That's great. I'm, I'm sure I'm sure Ken is going to add like slightly moist eyes right now when he hears that. That's a wonderful, wonderful statement. Thank you so much for that. And then before you get started, so maybe you can start preparing the your screen already for yeah. the seminar. And to the audience, just as a reminder, at the end, we stop a little bit abruptly. You'll be seeing once again the Twitter handle. There will be plenty of questions. I know Roxanne's uh, presentations. I know they're excellent. And there will be plenty of questions in the end. And when you want to ask your questions, please do so via Twitter. It will show this at the end of it. And then we have to close the webinar. So without further ado, uh, here you are, Roxanne. Thanks so much for doing this. Thank you. Thank you again. So in just um, a few words to acknowledge all the women in research and all the women outside research. So um, our lab is called Immune Regulation and we are at the NIH within NIDCR. And what we are interested, as, as Burkett mentioned, is really the transcriptional regulation the, and how this leads into lineage development and the functional properties of um, dendritic cells or like lymph, um, hematopoietic subsets. So here is my email and, and the Twitter account for questions or the you can use the one from the Global Immunotalks. And um, what is the most important thing in research in general is the people who do it. And so I would like to start acknowledging all the people in the lab so the current members and uh, the past members. Um, and the work I'm gonna talk about is gonna be mostly what uh, Patrick did. I'm gonna briefly mention uh, Fabian's work. And as you can see from all those flags, we really cover five continents and it's incredible to be able to share our life stories and um, our origins. So, uh, the title of my talk uh, is uh, special. So it's a new kid on the block. And it's really like trying to understand um, how the heterogeneity of dendritic cells can be dissected by looking at the development of cells. So as you all know, um, the hematopoietic um, development occurs from the bone marrow where a hematopoietic stem cell differentiates through the progressive expression of specific transcription factor into the mature subsets. And we identify three major branches. The erythroid branch, which gives rise to uh, erythrocytes and megakaryocytes, which then uh, produce platelets. The lymphoid branch, which gives rise to um, all innate and adaptive lymphocytes, and the myeloid branch, which generates uh, all granulocytes, dendritic cells and PDCs, as well as uh, monocytes and macrophages. And we try to look at the development of cells, and we, as, like, as you've heard, we were interested in dendritic cell development. And many years back, uh, Ken Shortman had shown that dendritic cells were capable of uh, um, arising from myeloid progenitors as well as lymphoid progenitor. And so we looked for the um, genes which would uh, enable us to dissect or discriminate the lymphoid from the myeloid branch. And so Fabian in the lab um, um, identified a transcript or a protein, an enzyme, DNTT, which appeared to be very specific for the lymphoid lineage. We weren't lucky in identifying um, genes which would trace or which would mark the myeloid compartment, but this seemed to be a good option to look the other way. So what comes from uh, lymphoid progenitors or from the lymphoid development? And so um, DNTT or uh, terminal deoxynucleotidyl transferase is an independent uh, um, template independent polymerase, which is responsible for the addition of N nucleotides within the VDJ joining region of B cell receptor and T cell receptor. And so he targeted um, this uh, gene by replacing the stop codon with a self cleaving P2A uh, peptide followed by the extracellular domain of the human CD4. And so like a single RNA would be produced 
um, the P2A will um, result in the cleavage of the two protein. And whenever the NTT would be expressed, um, um, the cells would also express this human C4. And we could mark the cells by using an anti-human C4 antibody. The same strategy was used to develop a lineage tracer mouse model by replacing the human CD4 cassette with an induced, with an improved CRE recombinase. And so when crossing the mice to a reporter lineage like the Rosa Lockstop Lox YFP, every cell which once expressed uh, TDT would be labeled by YFP. And so uh, we hope that these um, mice will allow us to look at lymphoid and myeloid development. Unfortunately, many more cells were traced. And so, um, and, and I encourage you to look at this uh, publication. So we couldn't use the mouse for the purpose of dissecting all the dendritic cells, which would be lymphoid derived, but it allowed us to look in a very detailed way within the early hematopoietic development at when lineage restriction starts to occur. So now let's shift a little bit gears. And so um, our interest in, in this question was mostly focused on plasma cytoid dendritic cells. And what is interesting about these cells is that they are indeed or were identified as the one which produce high amounts of type 1 interferon and they're important in antiviral immunity. However, they were also described as a capable of performing antigen presentation, had been used um, in anti-tumor um, immunity in clinical trials, and they have been suggested to play a fundamental role in certain autoimmunities, such as uh, lupus or, or psoriasis. And so this diversity in function was uh, um, um, residing was where residing our curiosity and where we thought uh, where do PDC um, come from and so as I mentioned before it was known that PDCs could be generated from a myeloid progenitor which would express the um, MCSF receptor or macrophage colony stimulating factor receptor as well as from a lymphoid progenitor which would be characterized by the expression of the IL-7 receptor. And the transcription factors were uh, pretty much, or most, the most important transcription factors are listed here. And in both cases, um, when affected, they lead to a, a complete or significant deficiency of uh, plasma cytoid dendritic cells. So, we try to dissect this. And so this is the gating strategy that we would use. We would look for um, fleet 3 expressing progenitor, which comprises both lymphoid and myeloid progenitors. And then using the L7 receptor or the MCSF receptor, we identify lymphoid precursor or myeloid precursor or common DC progenitors. And we included in our analysis also the one subset which is negative for both marker, which was suggested by ONAI to include the highest uh, potential for PDC um, development. And so when we put um, this three subset in culture under fleet ligand conditions, which um, allows to generate PDCs as well as TDCs, we can see that the majority of the output is within the IL-7 receptor, so the lymphoid uh, progenitors. So these lymphoid cells have really the highest precursor frequency uh, for uh, plasma cytoid dendritic cells. Um, and those cells are the only one which can give rise to CD19 positive B cell progenitors when put um, under uh, OP9 culture in the presence of FLIT3 ligand. So we decided to validate this observation also in uh, vitro and uh, in vivo under competitive conditions. So we took a CD45.2 mouse and isolated this lymphoid progenitor and then put them in a one-to-one -one ratio either with themselves as a control or with these other precursors. 
And as you can see here, um, this is in the control, both um, IL-7 receptor uh, do not compete with each other, so they generate equal amounts of PDCs. However, um, when we put them in competition with this double negative or common DC progenitor, most PDCs are generated from um, the lymphoid precursors, suggesting that also in a competitive setting, most PDCs are lymphoid derived. Um, we uh, looked at the in vivo uh, pot potential of those uh, precursors, and again, we observed the same thing as in vitro. Over 80% or around 80% of PDCs are generated from a lymphoid progenitor. And when we look at conventional dendritic cells, here we see the opposite. Most conventional DCs are generated from a myeloid progenitor, which expresses uh, MCSF receptor or CD115. Um, so we decided to try to narrow down uh, the search for a committed precursor. And so within this IL-7 receptor expressing progenitors, we use these two markers, Li6D and Siglec H. Siglec H we knew was expressed on um, uh, progenitors of, of PDCs as well as DC because the uh, Siglec H DTR mouse showed a reduction in dendritic cells. And the Li6D, because we thought would identify uh, B cell committed cells. Um, so we end up with three subsets, so double negative, single positive for Li6D, and double positive for um, Li6D and Siglic H. And so we did the same trick, so we put them under a flit tree ligand condition to look at their PDC output. And what you can see is that the double positive progenitor have exclusive PDC potential. So this, the only cells which come out from this culture are PDCs, suggesting that it is a committed uh, progenitor. It is a pre-PDC um, subset. And we confirm this by looking at the lymphoid development. And indeed, under B cell polarizing condition, the double positive cells had lost any B cell potential, which was mostly confined within um, Li6D single positive uh, precursors. So the Li6D um, Siglic H double positive cells represent indeed what is a committed PDC progenitor. And so we looked at the transcriptional factors which are expressed uh, um, by um, lymphoid progenitor. And we looked for um, IRF8, which is known to be required for PDC development, and EBF1, which is known to be required for B cell development. And indeed, within the double positive progenitor, the expression of IRF8 is high and seems to be exclusive. There is no, in, no expression of EBF1. Whereas the single positive cells, which contain the highest B cell precursor frequency, they have high levels uh, of expression of EBF1. And the double negative cells appear to be the precursor of both subsets which is not yet, um, uh, has not yet turned on uh, high levels of IRF8 or EBF1. So we wanted to validate that these progenitors are indeed uh, um, uh, precursor of PDCs. And so we put them in culture and looked at other markers which were characterizing uh, PDC cells or mature PDCs. And indeed it requires um, um, couple of days, so three days, uh, three to four days, to generate uh, um, um, B220 positive, CCR9 positive, and Li6C positive mature PDCs. Whereas other markers which identify more progenitor cells, such as the uh, FLIT3 um, or, or the receptor for FLIT3 ligand and IL-7 are downregulated. And um, there is, it doesn't seem like there is an induction of the MCSF receptor throughout this um, differentiation. So within this uh, four days, three to four days, the cell acquire the functional property of PDCs, which is the production, the capacity to produce type 1 interferon here measured by interferon alpha, 
to a similar level as isolated splenic PDCs. And they also acquire a morphology which is um, similar to isolated uh, PDCs. So they move from a very uh, round and smooth uh, um, cytoplasm to a more complex uh, pattern. Um, so if we go back to our developmental scheme, um, we can see or we identified really the uh, progenitor of PDCs, which express lysine 16 and cyclic H, and they appear to mostly derive from lymphoid progenitor, which are characterized by the expression of I7 receptor. So now the question was like, are these cells which arise from either progenitor the same cell, or do they identify different subsets which converge to a unique phenotype of plasma cytoid dendritic cells. And to address this question formally, uh, we moved into uh, single cell technology. And so uh, what you can see here is a single cell of isolated uh, PDCs sorted as uh, uh, BSC2 cyclic H expressing cells. The red one are the splenic uh, PDCs and the blue one are the bone marrow PDCs. And as you can see uh, um, by the expression level and each dot represents a cell, um, there is a common PDC signature across all subsets. So they express TCR4, which is the main transcription factor for PDCs. They express IRF8 and they express BST2. However, um, the cells also split up into two major clusters. So cluster one, which um, seems to be characterized by a lymphoid signature. There is the expression of Ly6T, CCR9, and the NTT that we identified as a very specific lymphoid marker, uh, an MZB1. On the other side, the cluster eight, which is up here, identified with the expression of myeloid genes, such as LGALS3, ZBTB46, CD14, and CX3CR1, suggesting that PDCs were indeed segregating into a lymphoid and a myeloid subset. So using the um, genes identified by single cell sequencing, and in particular, using uh, ZBTB46 GFP reporter mice, which were uh, generated by uh, Ken Murphy, we were able to identify a set of markers which allowed us to segregate into two population by flow cytometry, these PDCs, which were um, the conventional PDCs, which were characterized by myeloid signature and that represent about 80% of PDCs from those myeloid PDCs, which we refer to as uh, PDC-like cells. And so this allowed us to sort the cells. And this is like uh, the gating that we use to identify the cells by flow cytometry using siglec H and BSC2. Here we have uh, PDCs. And the introduction of CBTB46 allows really the separation of those two subsets into conventional PDCs and PDC-like cells. So now the capacity to um, segregate those cells by flow cytometry allowed us to start to address some functional properties. And so we looked for the feature of, um, like most characteristic feature of PDCs, which is the type one interferon production. And both cells, uh, independently of whether they were um, characterized by a lymphoid or a myeloid signature, produced equal amounts and high amounts of uh, type 1 interferon. However, the antigen presentation capacity of uh, uh, PDCs or what was assigned to PDCs seemed to segregate within the myeloid PDCs or uh, PDC-like cells, which had uh, a similar, not as well, but a similar um, um, capacity to induce T cell proliferation when um, um, activated. So going back to the functional properties of, of properties of PDCs, we wondered whether 
um, conventional PDCs would be more relevant or would be representing more innate type functions, so like related to antiviral immunity, which is mostly um, within their uh, type 1 interferon production, whereas the myeloid uh, PDC or PDC like cells would more be um, specific uh, to antigen presentation or like dendritic cell features. And obviously, the question was like, which of the two subsets then would matter in the context of um, autoimmunity? And so we try to characterize those two subsets um, in a more detailed uh, way. And so again, here, uh, the, the way that we use um, to distinguish the two subsets by um, gating on, on PDCs and then using the uh, GFP reporter, and then the two conventional DCs. And what you can see here uh, by um, uh, cytospin is like how different the two cells are. So these are the conventional PDCs as you've seen them before, uh, whereas these uh, PDC-like cells have a polylobated nuclei and are very different from conventional PDCs. And they somehow resemble some of the cells which uh, are comprised within the type 2 dendritic cells, which remain still a very heterogeneous subset of dendritic cells. And here are the um, DC1 compartment, which is again um, pretty homogeneous in, in appearance. So we took advantage of um, different uh, uh, platforms. And here is like, uh, we looked at the to over 200 markers, surface markers, um, to identify, trying to identify specific markers which would enable us to look at PDCs and PDC-like cells and um, understand more about their function by looking at their expression profiles. So um, this is a projection of all the subset, and here is the expression of cyclic age. And as you can see, cyclic age is mostly identifying PDCs, but is also expressed within uh, PDC-like cells. The same is true for BSC2. XCR1 is really the best marker for type 1 dendritic cells, whereas ZBTB46 is mostly expressed by uh, all DC2 as well as uh, DC1 cells. And so we had or we scrolled through these uh, over 200 markers and what we identified was um, selected genes which seem to be higher expressed in PDCs. Um, and here is some of the example like uh, um, CCR8 or CD49E, so the, the um, uh, the, the, or, or uh, uh, CX3CR1. However, none of this marker was unique to the PDC-like subset. A lot of them were shared with conventional PDCs. Some were shared with both dendritic cells, type 1 and type 2, or some with one of the two uh, DC subset, either DC1 or here a fraction of the DC2 compartment. So um, we then try to understand more about their function by looking at their tissue distribution. And here in orange PDC like cells, um, you can see how they are abundant or they seem to be more abundant in selective tissue. Here is the heart, the brain, and this includes the parenchyma as well as the meninges and the thymus. So PDC like cells seems to be um, specific within tissues where immune responses rather, are rather dampened and, and not promoted. Whereas conventional DCs seem to uh, be more present within uh, secondary lymphoid tissues, such as spleen, mesenteric lymph nodes, or, or skin draining lymph nodes, or small intestine. Um, so from this analysis, it seemed that PDC-like cells would rather be um, a small fraction or would represent a small fraction of, uh, um, of dendritic cells, uh, um, which had a prevalence in tissues where immune responses are not induced. 
So we wanted to make sure because of this high expression of myeloid markers uh, or monocyte markers such as CD14 and CX3CR1 that they belong to the DC lineage. And for this reason, we looked um, at again CBTB46 GFP expression and CD26, which was suggested by uh, Martin Guillaume as one of the best markers to segregate dendritic cells from uh, monocytes um, and uh, granulocytes. And as you can see here, PDC-like cells really seem to identify with conventional DCs based on CBTB expression and within all DCs based on uh, CD26, including um, um, like DC1 and DC2. So another feature that identifies dendritic cell is their dependency on FLIT3 ligand. And we knew that FLIT3 ligand um, could generate the cells or could generate PDCs. So we looked at the uh, FLIT3 ligand deficient mice. And as you can see, the reduction in PDC-like cells appear to be equivalent as it was for other dendritic cell subsets, such as DC1, DC2, or conventional PDCs. Again, suggesting a common uh, lineage or a common developmental requirement of those cells on uh, FLIT3 ligand. So because the uh, distribution, the organ distribution and the, the uh, surface marker expression didn't allow us to identify or to understand more in terms of their functional properties, we performed and we started with bulk RNA sequencing. And we did that across four different tissues, so bone marrow, mesenteric lymph node, thymus, and spleen. And we did that for um, all subsets, so PDCs, uh, PDC-like cells, as well as uh, type 1 and type 2 conventional DCs. And as you can see, um, the cells, uh, PDC-like cells, clustered closer to plasma cytoid dendritic cells as compared to uh, the other two or the conventional DC subset. However, they were very different and they seemed really to cluster based on their identity and not of their, uh, on their tissue of origin. So we looked again for uh, surface marker expression as well as for transcription factors as well as many more things that are not shown here, trying to gain more insights into the cells. And as you can see, again, PDC like cells really share a lot of uh, transcripts with conventional PDCs and many more than compared to uh, type uh, one or type two conventional DCs. One interesting aspect, but I'm not gonna go into more details, is the fact that uh, they appear to um, be similar or more similar within the DC2 compartment with thymic dendritic cells. Again, a tissue which is rather preventing immune responses rather than inducing immune responses. And among the transcription factors that we identified, we observed uh, TCF4, which is essential for conventional PDCs. Um, as well, and we believe as well as for PDC-like cells, and um, KLF4, which, which um, I described uh, um, several years back in Ken's lab as being required for a double negative dendritic cell subset, double negative for CD11B and CD24, which seem, seem to be involved in um, type 2 immune responses. Um, so, we performed a, a pairwise comparison of the gene expression. And what, what was obvious is like, whenever we compared conventional PDCs with PDC-like cells, all the genes which seem to be enriched in PDC-like cell appear to be genes identifying with conventional DCs. And as you can see, the most differentially expressed gene is indeed CBTB46. We also had the myeloid gene or the uh, um, surface um, uh, fractal kinase receptor that we observed before, CX3CR1, as um, among the most differentially expressed. Whenever we compared PDC-like cells with DC2, we ended up with all genes 
which would identify conventional PVCs. So it was very hard to uh, try to understand based on their uh, transcriptional profile um, within bulk RNA sequencing, what could be special about these cells as they seem to really uh, be in between PDCs and DC2. And so um, we performed pathway analysis and what we saw is that there was an enrichment for proliferative markers or for proliferative uh, um, um, gene collections, as well as genes which were related to inflammatory responses. And this was intriguing because uh, um, um, like a year before, a few years before, a subset which had features of PDCs had been described by, um, uh, by two groups. One was, was Florent Ginou and, and by Villani um, on uh, um, single cell uh, peripheral blood mononuclear cells in humans as a similar subset which had precursor potential or had proliferative potential. And so we looked at this proliferative response um, based on the markers or the uh, um, chemokine markers that they would express. And so we put PDCs in culture with uh, FLIT3 ligand alone or in combination with GMCSF, IL3 or MCSF. And as you can see, and as was described by, by Colonna's group, PDCs do not really survive well in culture and they die uh, within a few days. Uh, PDC-like cells uh, that do not seem, again, to do much um, well in culture when cultured only in flit 3 ligand conditions. However, when we added um, homeostatic cytokines such as GM or MCSF, as well as IL-3, they seem to proliferate and they seem to expand. And the output of cells which came from uh, PDC-like cells was type 2 dendritic cells suggesting that the PDC-like cells, um, which appear to have a transcriptional profile similar to PDCs, were differentiating into conventional type 2 DCs. So we performed an in vivo transfer of PDC-like cells. And as you can see here, most of the cells that were recovered from uh, the chimeras were indeed type 2 dendritic cells. And here it is quantified over 90% of, um, of the cells generated were type 2 dendritic cells, whereas conventional PDCs remained PDCs and had showed no plasticity. So because of the KLF4 expression, we decided to look into the KLF4 deficient mice. And what we observed was that in the absence of, of KLF4, we knew DC2 compartment was affected because of the lack of this uh, TH2 driving dendritic cells. And we, we confirmed this um, again in, 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 uh, in, in, in my lab. But what was surprising was that the amount of PDC-like cells, instead of being reduced as expected, was increased. And these two information suggested that there could have been a block in differentiation so that KLF4 would be required for the development of PDC-like cells uh, to generate type 2 dendritic cells. And so to understand that, we went back to this mixed bone marrow chimeras. We took wild type cells, which were CD45.1.2, or KLF4 conditional knockout, which were CD45.2, and put them in a, in a, a, a lethally irradiated host and looked at the engraftment of, uh, of cells. And as you can see, there was no difference in the total uh, engraftment of the cells. However, the type 2 dendritic cells arising from um, KLF4 deficient mice were significantly reduced. Um, we saw the same increase in uh, PDC like cells that we observed in, um, in the full knockout or in, in KLF4 deficient mice, but we also saw an increase in the other subset, again, suggesting that there was indeed a block of differentiation 
uh, from PDC-like cells to type 2 dendritic cells. And when we looked more in details within these type 2 dendritic cells, we observed that the CX3CR1 positive disease were almost completely absent or could not be generated. There was a strong reduction also of the other DC subset, but the subset which was mostly affected was what was described by Brown et al. as the CDC2B uh, um, disease. So we performed a single cell RNA sequencing of wild type and KLA4 uh, deficient uh, CD11B positive dendritic cells. And this is what we obtained. So we have a cluster, a big cluster, which identifies the uh, plasma cytoid dendritic cells. We have a cluster or two clusters which identify type 1 dendritic cells, the type 2 dendritic cells, and the migratory disease based on CCR7 or activated disease um, um, that, that have been um, described in, in many papers now. PDC-like cells were surprising because they seemed to split into a fraction which was very close to conventional PDCs and one fraction which was close to this cluster 5 type, type 2 disease, which identified with this um, CDC2B uh, cells. And so when we split the genotypes in wild type and KLA4 knockout cells, what we observed was that in the wild type, most of the cells were rather close to type 2 dendritic cells, whereas in the context of KLA4 deficiency, most cells remained uh, in proximity of the PDCs, and there was a strong reduction of the orange cluster, which represented the DC2, uh, DC2 subset. And so when we looked at the expression of, of those markers, the ones which were indeed affected were the CX3CR1 or the collectin A, which was another marker identifying these uh, CDC2B cells. And so suggesting uh, that PDC-like cells were mostly CDC2 precursor and were generating mostly these CDC2B precursors. So when we put it again in, into this developmental context, um, we can say that about 80% of conventional PDCs is derived from a lymphoid progenitor. A very small fraction, or like about 20%, um, is, uh, can still be generated from myeloid cells. Um, we don't know how much this percentage um, is true in vivo because um, we could only address it upon transfer or under known physiologic conditions. And so more work needs to be done here. Um, we end up with uh, CDP or MCSF expressing progenitors, which are the major source for pre-DC1 and generate um, uh, type 1 dendritic cells. We have uh, pre-DC2, which are also generated from CD115, as well as were shown to gen be generated from CD115 negative cells. Now, um, it remains to be addressed what is the con contribution of these two subset to the DC2 or to the pre-DC2 cells. Um, on the other side, PDC-like cells, instead of being mature cells, they really seem to be at this stage of development. And we knew that KLA4 was necessary for the development of CX3, CR1 expressing DC, but they were also able to generate the um, uh, other fraction of type 2 DCs, which is characterized by the expression of ESAM, which was shown to be notch 2 dependent. Now, trying to understand more about their, their lineage, we um, looked or we generated the human C2 CRE um, ROSA YFP lineage tracer. And as you can see, within this mouse, all PDCs are labeled, and a large fraction of PDC-like cells are labeled. And about 25% of conventional type 2 dendritic cells are labeled, suggesting that at least 25% of DC2 is generated from PDC-like cells. We cannot um, 
determine how many of the non-labeled cells could be generated because we still have a significant fraction of PDC-like cells which is not labeled by this lineage tracer. So in collaboration with uh, uh, Marco Colonna at, at WashU, um, we generated the CD300 um, C um, iris i p 2 a human CD2, which allows for both like um, detection of the reporter cassette as well as lineage tracing. And so the reporter gene, so the CD300C is um, expressed by all PDCs and the majority of PDC like cells and not by any other subset. But in the lineage tracer, again, it labels all PDCs as expected, the majority of PDC like cells but also a large fraction of type two uh, disease and a minor fraction of type one disease. And again, this suggests that a large fraction of type two dendritic cells could be generated by PDC-like cells. So going back to their function, we knew that uh, PDC-like cells had equal capacity to produce type one interferon and um, had a um, strong antigen presentation capacity uh, towards T cells, which was similar to conventional DCs. So we try to understand a bit more on that. And so we stimulated with all these um, different uh, TLR ligands. And what we observed was that very surprising that PDC like cells seem to have even a better capacity than conventional DCs pooled together, um, DC1 and DC2, in terms of um, inducing T cell proliferation. However, this proliferative capacity or this antigen presentation capacity, which was better than conventional PDCs, was rather related to the fact that those cells were progenitors. So when looking at day three at the end of the culture, how many cells or dendritic cells were surviving, we had a much higher um, number of cells within PDC-like cells, suggesting that um, they generated type two disease and those type two disease were leading to this uh, T cell activation. Um, in terms of cross presentation capacity, this was really mostly confined within type one dendritic cell as, as shown by Gaetano and, and Rice Sosa and, and Ken Murphy. Um, PDC like cell had really like only minor cross presentation capacity for um, um, membrane associated antigens. So we then looked at KLF4 deficiency and IRF4 uh, deficiency, both transcription factor suggested to be very important for DC and type two dendritic cells. And what we observed was that this antigen presentation capacity in the absence of KLF4, but not IRF4 was um, completely abrogated independently on the, of the type of stimulation that the cells were, um, that the cells were activated with. So in terms of cytokine production, um, PDC-like cells seem to be um, really good and, and overperforming conventional disease in uh, driving IL-6, IL-22, IL-17, and IL-10 production by T cells upon activation. And there, here like, are the different stimulation. CPGB seem to be the best um, in this context, R848 for IL-22. So suggesting that the, the cells which were generated, so this DC2-derived PDC, uh, PDC-like derived DC2, induced a T cell, um, CD4 T cells, that had a pro-inflammatory and a tissue repair um, related uh, features. So when we looked at, again, KLF4 deficiency, this was abrogated. So in the absence of KLF4, the cells do not differentiate and they will not lead to the activation of T cells. And what was surprising was that this absence, or when we looked at KLF4 deficiency, uh, was not in the context of inflammatory response, but rather in the context of homeostatic responses. So the number of CD4 IL-17 producing T cells 
in epithelial tissue, such as um, within the skin, was profoundly reduced in the absence of this uh, PDC-like derived DC2. So to conclude, uh, um, what I showed you is like, we know or we um, suggest that, or we showed that most conventional PDCs are lymphoid derived and that the progenitor to PDCs is characterized by Li6D and SIGLIC-H. Most of the conventional dendritic cell as well likely as well as PDC-like cells are myeloid derived. Um, the the pre-DC1 has been identified by uh, Schlitzer as well as by uh, Ken Murphy, and Ken Murphy identified uh, the CD226 as the best marker to look for DC1 progenitor. And the pre-DC2 um, give rise to all the DC2. Now, what is the in vivo contribution with, of the PDC-like or the pre-DC2 to the pool of mature dendritic cells under steady state, as well as under inflammatory condition, still needs to be addressed because none of the lineage tracer that we had was good enough to, to look at that. Um, so, however, what we know is that PDCs really seem to be important in the context of viral infection. They produce type 1 interferon. We still need to understand what is their role in autoimmunity and in the presentation of viral antigen, whether they are capable of, of presenting antigen in the context of viral infection. We know that this double negative or KL4 dependent DC2 are important to po polarize TH2 immunity. Uh, against allergens and extracellular pathogens. We identified this PDC-like derived DC2, which express uh, the monocyte marker CX3CR1, which seems to be more related to um, protect or to um, prime steady state uh, TH17 cells. So they likely are involved in the recognition of self or microbiome. Um, we have the notch-dependent DC2, which are uh, important for fungal and extracellular bacterial responses and produce IL-23, and the DC1, which are essential in the context of intracellular pathogens and anti-tumor immunity. And they are indeed the, the subset which is devoted or mostly devoted to cross-presentation and to the production of, of IL-12. And so with that, I would uh, um, finish with, with the acknowledgements. And it was indeed an incredible uh, privilege to have as my first PhD student, Patrick, who has been um, devoted and, and hardworking and, and a wonderful person. I would like to thank all the other people in the lab, um, Robert, the bioinformatician, who helped us throughout the years, as well as all other members, and, and uh, Jan Anderson and, and Ton, who unfortunately are, are not here anymore, Marco and, and Mike White, for their help in, in, in uh, providing us with the CD300C uh, mice, um, Carolyn King and, and David, uh, University of Basel, Alan Brühlhardt for, for the help in, in managing the mouse colony, and a lot of people here at the NIH, in particular Jasmine, um, um, Nicola uh, in, in Jasmine's group, Giorgio Trinchieri, Mihaili Leonakis, and, and all um, the team, which, which is defined as the Istanbul team, and uh, um, Christian Beisel from the ATH, and Minor Buslinger for giving us the um, uh, reporter mice. And, and thank you all for the attention. Thank you so much, Roxanne. This was an exciting uh, uh, lecture. Very much enjoyed it. And I have a ton of questions and I'd like to ask them right now. But as I've mentioned initially, um, we do not have um, a question round here live. Instead, as you can see now uh, in this slide, you can search for Global Immunotalks, um, find a tweet that says ask questions for Roxanne. And, and just contact her otherwise, and um, we'll, we'll have a lively uh, exchange of questions and ideas. Once again, Roxanne,
thank you so much for joining us today. It was wonderful. And thank you all for supporting Global Immunotalks and, and, and continuing this post-COVID, at least we think hopefully for a while, uh, <laughs> pandemic. So thanks so much. And everyone thank have you. a good morning, good afternoon, and good night. Take care. Bye. Bye.